So I'm going to give you a little background on our speaker, Jeff. Jeff is an author and paranormal researcher, and he has a passion for the sciences, a background in the military, and a penchant for investigating the unusual. So he's a natural um, skeptic, but he's very kind-hearted. He has a great sense of humor, and uh, uh, this expert has assured me that he's been able to research and debunk any events or urban myths that may or may not be true, anything that we can think about, including UFOs, uh, whilst assuring us that, we are in, that there's indeed real supernatural events that do occur. Uh, he is a researcher of ancient civilizations, legendary mysteries, and hauntings. And uh, he started work when he contributed to Fate magazine in 2002, has written over 10 books in the past, and this has encouraged him to research and publish his work. Uh, yet the note that what I really want to introduce you to tonight is his background. He has spiritual beliefs that were reformed from an evangelical perspective viewpoint. And through his work on extensive factual, historical, and case studies on reincarnation, he even has analyzed the Bible's viewpoint on these concepts. So, we are so pleased that he could take the time to meet us tonight. Uh, and you can explore Jeff's research and his ideas and his experiences on the link provided on our website, also at www.ourcuriousworld.com. So, uh, is Jeff with us yet tonight? Hello, Jeff. Yeah, absolutely. How are you doing, Carmen? Hi, how are you? Nice, nice of you to join us. And well, nice to, to have here. you here. Well, it's great to be here. It's uh, nothing else to do tonight on such a rainy night. So just to uh, sit and talk to like-minded people and uh, see if we can uh, learn anything from each other. Exactly, rather cozy, and that means the rain is coming our way on the East Coast here, too, <laughs> for the yeah, listeners we'll that want to know the weather yeah. here while we're at it. That's right. good. So, Jeff, I had just a chance to review some of your work, but why don't you help us understand uh, what you've done, because you have a wide body of work and background that you've actually authored and penned. Can you tell me a bit more about your last, um, your most favorite books that you've actually researched in the past? Well, asking me which is my favorite book is like asking me which is my favorite child. You know, it's, <laughs> it's not <laughs> fair. Uh, but, uh, you know, I've, I've enjoyed all of them. They've all led me in different directions. Uh, the, the books have been kind of an outgrowth of my spiritual journey. Um, I started out looking at reincarnation, and then that led me into ghosts, and then uh, I would ask things like, well, how does, uh, you know, um, extraterrestrials fit into all this? And so then that would lead me into UFOs. So I just kind of follow uh, the, the lead of spirit, what, whatever direction it leads me. And then I uh, try to put together my thoughts into a form that people can uh, get some objectivity with. Uh, it's, I don't try to convince people of any one particular position. And I try to point out the flaws as I see them in, in some people's uh, uh, theories, to not to humiliate them or belittle them, but to see if we can uh, find the truth to all of this stuff and, and come to a better understanding of what's going on in this uh, amazing world we live in. Yeah, and what I wanted to explain to my, my uh, listeners is, for example, the type of work that he tends to do. This man is, is certainly not gullible. He does do his research, and that actually his background is an interesting primer for, this, for him to be able to take out any theories or um, correct on any theories that we might find plausible, such as, you know, I was reading a little bit on your UFO work, and what I found was very interesting was your work that you did on the Majestic documents, your research that you've done on that, and and uh, obviously that you had um, some knowledge as to how these documents were prevent presented in the military or in the CIA uh, and how that fit into your writing. In other words, he's very good at being able to parse how certain things are presented and sniff out any inconsistencies in major, major theories that are giving rise to urban myths such as UFOs. In fact, like for example, one of the theories was with the Majestic documents. For those of you that don't know what those are, those are a list of um, so-called hidden CIA documents that were only being released now, that there are simply not enough to justify um, the sheer amount of volume of information that should be out there regarding extraterrestrials. For example, right Jeff? Yeah, that's that's uh, the the gist of it. Uh, I look at the majestic documents kind of uh, from the perspective of a detective. Uh, if someone brought these to me and said, "Hey, look, and I got this letter, you know, supposedly signed by 
Harry Truman uh, that has to deal with UFOs. Yes. The question is, you know, uh, really, uh, how do you approach something like that? Uh, do you look, you look at it logically? You can look at it, uh, you know, forensically. There's a lots of different ways to look at it. And my my issue with the UFO community um, is that th th there's a need to believe, and it's so strong that a lot of people will accept these things without really doing the the hard work of determining whether it's true. Now. That being said, there are those out there who are supposedly experts who authenticate these things. But for every expert who's willing to authenticate it, you can find five who will tell you it's bogus. So you're right back to square one again. And that's been really the problem with a lot of the uh, UFO uh, conspiracy stuff all along, is that for everybody you can find that will support it, you can find five people who will debunk it, and then you really don't know what's going on out there. And I appreciate that because I really want to believe, God knows, we really want them to come in and fix things, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> See if they can do as big a, a, a worse a job than we're doing, I suppose. And, uh, <laughs> no, you'd think not. Unless they're already involved, Jeff, then we're in trouble. <laughs> well, I think they're smart enough to keep their hands off of things and just say, hey, look, I'm not going to get involved with that mess. Uh, just like uh, you know, neighbors who are fighting, you don't want to go over there and get involved in their, <laughs> in their squabble. I know, I know. And so like, so this is interesting. So what this, this, this does indicate to me and what this does illustrate is your journey um, specifically to take just certain th ideas, which is mythical creatures, ancient civilizations, uh, UFOs, for example, and learn through the processes of these uh, or your research what exactly they were. And then this brought you back around to sort of having decided to study certain things like the Sasquatch, or sorry, that's the Canadian version, the Bigfoot. Um, mm -hmm. Was that some sort of a side pet project of yours, mind the pun, um, for, your, uh, for your research? Or how did that link into uh, your, your, your ultimate uh, goal, which was to research in reincarnation? Well, I suppose of all the different phenomena out there, uh, when I was growing up, I thought the, the Bigfoot was the one that was most intriguing to me. Uh, it was kind of like everybody's boogeyman. And, uh, you know, I, I remember as a kid seeing uh, the, this documentary called The Legend of Boggy Creek. And I remember that just scared the heck out of me. And I've been fascinated with this, this possibility ever since. Um, and I, I kind of kept uh, tabs on it over the years. And, in fact, it was my first published article was on, uh, on Bigfoot, the Patterson film. Uh, which really got me started on my writing career. So it's interesting how how God used an interest of mine from when I was just a kid and basically used it as the instrument to get me involved in writing full-time uh, and moving into all of these other books. So I'm looking at this here, and that would have been your first, your your published novels. Also, I wanted to point out to our readers here that uh, Jeff is now writing out his characters that he has researched. So, in other words, he's gotten to know his research so well that he's turning them into stories, um, which uh, he has samples on his pages. It's very beautifully written, and as I, the only way I could point it out was, was the word chthonic, which is otherworldly or underworldly. Um, definitely some very, very dark imagery there. And uh, this brings me into, also, I noticed in your private writing, in your novel writing, that you still have a very uh, a strong aptitude towards going back into a sort of a, a, not a military, but a kind of a, uh, a very strong um, position or background in which you've always got the good guy and the bad guy, even if it's the creatures, right? Usually I see that through, you know, your amazing story, the Serpin Gigante, Gigante, sorry, I'm just trying to say that properly. It's such a beautiful title for um, a book that you have. I mean, I could almost see these being developed into movies, um, so wonderfully written. Now, this is kind of an expression, I guess, of all the research that you've done over time. So what I wanted to do was today was also really focus on, you, it brought you to this point that you've researched all this material. You want to say something about how this came about. And Jeff, I want you to please give us a little bit of background on where you were brought up um, and also what you're doing now. I mean, I see you've been through a very, very varied history with your, uh, he's an illustrator as well, as having illustrated and worked in the military 
worked for the military, and has been a writer, a prolific writer. So tell us a bit about yourself, uh, Jeff. I know that uh, n- not all the way back, but for sure, go into this, because then we're going to go into your past lives. Because I thought it's very interesting life. how it links up to your current life. Okay, well, you know, my, the, the five-cent uh, biography is uh, I was a veteran of the Navy. I was in the Navy uh, right out of high school. Uh, after that, I went into art school, became a graphic designer. Uh, I've been doing that pretty much full time for the rest, you know, since uh, since the mid '80s. Uh, my uh, background is essentially um, I was born a Catholic, kind of left the church, became born again when I was 21 years old. Was very active in the evangelical churches for a good 20 years. Uh, eventually, began to question some elements of my faith. Began to search other uh, other faith structures. Uh, and see if I could find some answers there. That led me into um, reincarnation, uh, which I found to be something that answered a lot of questions for me. And, and from that, it sort of propelled me into into uh, um, just looking at the world in a different way, in a much more expansive way. That uh, has brought me basically to today, where uh, about five, six, seven years ago, I started writing these books on different different uh, subjects of the paranormal, kind of looking at them from an objective view, and then that has led me ultimately into novel writing. So taking a lot of these creatures that I've read about, uh, even if I haven't written about them before, and using them as characters in uh, in novels, I think it's a much uh, more entertaining way to teach people about the world out there. Uh, I, I decided to uh, come up with a uh, a different kind of twist on it. You know, I'm a happily married man, and I thought it would be kind of neat to have the characters in my trilogy be a, a husband and wife, uh, scientists, who go off looking for these different creatures and inevitably finding them. That way you have not only the the interesting creatures that they come up with, but also their interaction, how they work with each other, how they interact and, and play off each other's strengths and weaknesses to, to get out of the fixes they find themselves in. And I think that's what makes my books unique, is it's they're, they're, they're not just about uh, finding a monster and defeating it, but it's also about uh, how they will sacrifice for each other and, and how their love comes through um, when they're in these situations together and how they just kind of find ways to to get out of it and uh the the one of the characters uh in this in these books is a strong christian herself so and then her husband is uh more of a, an agnostic so you got that dynamic at play too how does her faith uh you know affect uh the fact that she's a scientist and uh how she looks at these creatures so Jeff, i try to handle a lot of different mind, things if we ask place. what background she were from that's from pardon again your wife, what background is she from? My wife? Mm-hmm. Uh, Your real my, life my wife. wife. Yeah, my, <laughs> my wife is, uh, she's uh, uh, been strong in the church all of her life, and she's mm-hmm. uh, been very supportive of my uh, looking at different things, and she's gone in this journey with me. Mm-hmm. So I think that uh, a lot of my experiences with her in our lives, uh, how we work together, uh, has uh, translated into these books. So I, I, I can uh, see that. Mm-hmm. I, so that, that's kind of the way I wanted to do it. I just thought it would be a nice way to do it, uh, to tell stories that are entertaining and still tell us uh, a message uh, beyond just the uh, the action itself. Yeah, that's correct. And uh, so one of the things, so do tell me, and now you were Catholic and then you took up, you actually went into evangelism. And may, for the layman who doesn't understand the process of how it is to be snapped up into a spiritual endeavor, could you explain to us how you were not, um, how you were led into this particular uh, path, and then how you left? And 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 just give us a little background of that because we're always curious about people that have such we're, we're afraid of and in awe of people that have so much faith. Right? Well, I don't, you know, I don't know where where faith comes from. I don't know why one person seems to be interested in in faith and another person isn't. I, I don't know if that's a genetic mm-hmm. thing yeah, or what it point. is. But I remember ever since I was very young of always being aware of God and interested in God. 
Uh, I didn't really, you know, I was too young to have any kind of an articulated faith, but I was familiar with some of the Bible stories through the Catholic Church and through my catechism classes. And so when I was a young man, I was very curious about these things, and uh, I had met a number of people who were strong Christians who answered a lot of my questions. And one day I just said, well, this seems to be, you know, uh, where I belong. And so I became a Christian. I became, uh, um, tried to make myself as knowledgeable a Christian as I could by, you know, I read the Bible. I read a lot of uh, religious uh, literature over the next few years, tried to uh, uh, make myself uh, at least as knowledgeable as I could for uh, not having any formal theological training. And um, I, I really uh, enjoyed those years as a Christian. I, I think that I learned a lot about myself, about other people, but there was also a discontent. Um, I, I, I always was more or less afraid of God. I was always trying to please God, do things that I thought would make him happy. And that always sort of tainted uh, that relationship. And I also had issues with things like hell. You know, how could a good God send anybody to hell? Um, I had issues with uh, the second coming. You know, they were always talking about Jesus' coming and just never showed up. You know, and I thought, well, something, somebody's got something wrong here. And because of that, I began to look at other, uh, other ideas. And so one day I just felt like I had gotten as far as I could with Christianity. And if I was going to evolve spiritually any further, uh, I, I didn't have to abandon it. But I had to move on to the next set of lessons, if you will. And that's Which how I you sort of you know, leave it. Pardon? Which led you on to research for your writing? or did the, How long did this evolution take for you? I mean, I see here well, that you started writing in 2002. Right. I, well, I had been playing around with writing over the years. Uh, some of these manuscripts um, that are being published now are written you know, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, but um, so I was at the at the time I was a Christian. I was also looking at doing some writing. Um, I did some some Christian based writing, but I was basically just learning how to write. Uh, you have to write a lot of stuff before you're ready to actually publish something. Mm -hmm. And so I was going through all that. But uh, the the writing was kind of a, a natural outgrowth of my creative energies. Uh, you know, I was working for many years as an illustrator and a graphic designer. And that was, you know, one outlet, but it wasn't uh, the fullest expression of how I wanted to, to do things. I wanted to really uh, paint pictures with words more so than with, you know, pigment and, and pencil. And so that was a natural transition to go from artist to, uh, to writer. Uh, and it was kind of, I felt like I had been led there over a long period of time, you know, 15, 20, 25 years to finally get to the point where I had enough life experience um, and had read enough that I could, I could reasonably write and, and be saleable. And so it's been a tremendous adventure ever since, just uh, putting you know, words to paper and, uh, and enjoying uh, when people write me and say, you know, I really liked your book, I really got something out of it, you know, uh, it answered some questions for me. That's what makes it all worthwhile. Sure does, and now uh, when it uh, no, it, it must, and and that is something I want to experience one day too, Jeff. And Jeff, I wanted to ask you. So we're going into. I have a lot of questions here. I actually have some prepared for you, because many of us are uh, familiar with the concept of reincarnation. Usually, the Buddhist or the Hindu version of reincarnation. And uh, I was looking over uh, some of your. Uh, research and descriptions in some of your writings and I was impressed to see you actually sort of uh, pretty much understanding or trying to understand and also refute some of the uh, Christian versions of reincarnation. In other words, there are Christians, uh, for those of you that don't know this, but there are certain sects of Christianity and I believe of Islam as well that will be interested in ideas or notions of reincarnation. Yet you took some of these ideas and you took them apart. Why is that? Well, I'm of the opinion that people hold a, a small amount of the truth and they tend to embellish and make up the parts that you know, aren't complete. And I mm -hmm. think this is true whether it's reincarnation or any religious belief system. You, you get an element of the truth and then the rest of it seems to be uh, appendages that people have added over the years that tend to take away from the underlying message. And so 
with reincarnation, uh, I wanted to examine it not only from an Eastern standpoint, but from a Western standpoint to see uh, if there's any correlations, if they are, if there's any uh, consistency between it, and right. where it, uh, where it's inconsistent. You know, where I can see uh, things that doesn't that don't make sense, and so I, I kind of. Uh, did a little bit of both. I tried to think both east and west while I was writing uh, on this subject to try to find the things in it that uh, that just kind of resonated with me and that had uh, reinforced my own experiences. And the result was a couple of different books on the subject that uh, laid out my case for how reincarnation works to the best uh, of my understanding. Now, there might, I might be completely incorrect about a lot of it, but this is at least where I'm at with it and see if anyone else, if it resonates with anyone else. Do tell us a bit about the history of reincarnation, uh, if you don't mind, Jeff. Well, reincarnation is actually uh, one of the oldest belief systems uh, on Earth. It goes back into antiquity. Um, it seems to almost have been a natural part of, of people's belief systems. So they, they, the most early man didn't really understand that when you died, there was there was nothing or nothing else. Atheism is a fairly modern invention, uh, and people just assume that you you went on, and they would notice that, for example, uh, a child would be born who had very many of the characteristics of an uncle or an elder that had passed, mm-hmm. and they just naturally assume that okay, well, this child must be the reincarnation of the, of this elder. And so these these beliefs were you know, embellished over the centuries. They became much larger, much more sophisticated. Uh, and then, um, really, about uh, the time of uh, of Christ, when Christianity first came along, about the third or fourth century, as a major religious force, uh, they began challenging the whole notion of reincarnation because it was based off a very different perspective. Was that uh, you only live once, and then comes the judgment. Whereas reincarnation is you live many, many times and you go through many judgments. And uh, so the two uh, concepts were just not comp- uh, compatible. And so there's been this battle really ever since uh, between East and West over whether or not the soul does reincarnate over and over again or whether there is just a single experience. I know. In- wouldn't that make them kind of lazy? I mean, you'd think about a populace, right? The population. If they were told they could misbehave or allowed to misbehave a little in one life, and then they'll reap that, most people psychologically will go, oh, well, then I'll deal with that in my next life, right? Well, you, know, I, that's you, could, you can make think. the case both ways. Mm-hmm. Um, because within Christianity, of course, you can do all sorts of nasty things, and then if you're contrite and, you know, repent, well, you, you, you're not held accountable for it. Mm-hmm. So you can you can be a nasty person all your life, except on your be- deathbed, if you genuinely embrace Christ, uh, all of that goes away. So there's also there's also Christians who say, well, look, I'm I'm going to deal with it on my deathbed. I'll just do what I want to do now, uh, and do it, deal with it later. So you see that mindset in both East and Western religions. Yes, there are people in Eastern religions who say. I'm not going to worry about it. In this lifetime, I'll deal with the next lifetime. But there's also people who are very trapped in being very careful about everything they do because they don't want to deal with it in the next lifetime. Mm-hmm. You know, they realize it's going to be much worse. And if you're already born in poverty and you're thinking, my goodness, I'm going to come back even worse shape next time to pay for all these crimes, I mean, you're going to try to behave yourself. But it's human nature to try to want to get away with things, if you will. And both... Eastern and Western faiths give you that opportunity if that's your mindset, but it's, it, that's a very simplistic approach to, to these, uh, these ideas. You know, you were uh, saying that uh, I was reading through some of your, uh, your history. Now, for those of you that haven't had a chance to look at his history, uh, Jeff has uh, regressed into his past life. Now, um, one of the things he does discuss in his site and in his book is, is that he really was very particular about researching some of these past life regressionists, correct? And also the psychology behind it. So what I liked about his work was the way he was able to describe um, certain questions that we have, as in, if you're being interviewed by a past life regressionist, surely they're just going to make sure that you believe in your past life, right? And um, 
one of the things is that I would say that that is probably from my perspective, if I may bring an analogy, not true, because then you would think that I as a psychic will believe everything that is either spun out to me by other psychics or everything that I even um, say myself so that I would want to cross-reference everything. In fact, if anything, being a psychic has been made me extremely skeptical towards the spiritual industry, Jeff. And it makes me a lot more discerning. And I think that's partly what you have to understand when you listen to or read some of his work is, is that he's done a very thorough job of trying to explain those questions that we have. Um, so in other words, su suggestibility, if one is suggestive. Explain that, Jess, uh, Jeff, to us, please. Right. Um, one of the biggest uh, criticisms of reincarnation is that um, the the therapist who's putting you under could certainly can just suggest different ideas to you and you pick up on them and in an attempt to sort of uh, appease uh, the therapist you will play along or make up things uh, that you think the therapist wants to hear and you know there are also people who have very fantasy prone personalities they they really do imagine that they are uh, napoleon or somebody like that and uh, so, so reincarnation can sort of re reinforce those fantasies. So when you're really dealing with reincarnation, you have to be aware of the human propensity to want to believe in, you know, uh, unusual or strange things. That being said, if you are aware of that going into it, then uh, and you can, you know, uh, explain away some things using that explanation, what you're left with is the things that can't be explained so easily. You know, the, the past uh, life memories that are verifiable or the past life memories in children uh, as young as three or four years old uh, who would not be prone to making up stuff uh, as complex as the lives they describe. So you can, you can find, always find uh, explanations for a lot of it, but I try to get it down to that part of these experiences that you can't explain scientifically or psychologically and that's really where the truth lies in in those areas right and you were saying like for example some of the cases that were interviewed like um, for example I want to go into your story but let's say you take uh, your cousins or your your, nie your nephews your niece your nephew you were saying in your in your writing that they had fairly ordinary un unremarkable past lives, something that you would probably not really attribute to anything much special under regression. Um, and I, for one, have come across many a person, I can't tell you how many, Napole and I actually, I've met a few Cleopatras and uh, quite a few rock stars. You know, people are always mm -hmm. uh, reincarnating themselves into highly attractive people. And it's interesting to say to somebody, well, do you know that, for example, the countenance of Cleopatra, that nobody has a record of what she looks like, mm -hmm. yet everybody wants to adopt her countenance, right? Do you know that, that there's actually only one coin that exists with her actual profile? And it, she wasn't as attractive as she was made out to be. Oh, you're that powerful, I guess you don't need to be. Sorry? <laughs> you're that powerful, you don't need to be attractive. But. Yeah. Um, you know, well, you're, you're bringing up an high, interesting. But, you know, it's interesting to see people saying, "Well, I must have looked like that," you know. And well, it's like, really, you I, I think, your history. I think it's the idea you that you have that. an exciting um, past life. You know, if your present pa if your present life is kind of ordinary, there's people who are very attracted to this idea that I was much more interesting before, and and that's yes. uh, a trap that you you have to be careful about because it's easy to be caught up in that. But in the therapists that I've talked to uh, who do this for a living, who regress people, the majority of them uh, say that most of the past lives <clears throat> that people recount are very ordinary. They're, they're not famous people. They're, uh, they're just farmers or housewives or they're soldiers or whatever. And they're, and they're not really that interesting of lives in and of themselves. And that's what I think makes them so... Uh, interesting and so authentic is the fact that if we do live past lives, the chances are that very few of those past lives were of somebody of note. We were probably just very ordinary people, just as we usually are in this life. And to me, that was one of the most compelling evidences for it. And what is the most ordinary past life that you've heard of? 
for example? Oh, well, like uh, I was telling you with my niece, uh, she was uh, a printer at some little print shop that in is Pennsylvania. fascinating. A printer, yes. I mean, that is I rather mean, obscure for her to know that, you know? And, <laughs> you know, and she yeah. was talking about different printing process, presses, different types of processes that they use to, to make the plates. And she doesn't know anything about this stuff in her normal life. But she seemed to have a kind of a, uh, an understanding of how early 20th century printing worked. And even though it wasn't particularly exciting, I thought it was interesting that she was, uh, uh, was able to describe this process of, of printing um, that really would be something only who would, someone who had worked actually on a press would, would really know. So, like, when you have these characters that come through from the past, is there ever, uh, this is a silly question, I know, but for the layman, is there ever, ever any, an, an anim, ever an animal that comes through? You know, like, oink, oink, or squawk, or anything like that. Can we jump from species in our reincarnation? Well, you, you know, um, there are people who have, who claim that, you know, they can remember being an animal, uh, an eagle or a dinosaur or something like this. And, but uh, the, my research has shown that this is very unusual, very rare. You don't see it very often. Most people recall lives lived as humans. And I think the reason for that is because uh, an animal's limits in intellect and its ability to understand what's happening to it, it would really not have much to, to remember, you know, animals' lives are very straightforward, you know, they, they eat, they true. procreate, they die, and that's pretty much the extent of it, whereas humans, we think about our place in the universe and why we're here and all these different things like that, and so it makes more sense that you would remember something that's closer to what you're aware of now than it would be that you would remember being a cow or a chicken or something like that. That's true. They might not even have knowledge of how their language, how they would have expressed themselves. Jeff, one moment. We are going to go to a commercial break. We're going to take about 30 seconds out. My producer is going to put you through. Uh, thank you. Sit back for just one moment, and uh, we'll get on to our next questions. A new era in psychic services has begun. PsychicAccess.com you can connect with our psychic advisors by telephone or chat 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. All of our psychic advisors are interviewed, fully verified and accuracy tested, assuring you quality service. We are living in some very troubled times right now. More and more, the world's problems are affecting us on a personal level. You don't have to deal with this alone. Our highly accurate psychics, caring advisors and talented mediums can help with situations you are currently experiencing and can let you know what the future may hold for you. All new customers get a free six-minute reading. All you have to do is register. Why not visit us now and get a free reading at PsychicAccess.com. Hi, Jeff. We're back. Okay, so we have you here on for our next questions. So we were discussing animal lives, and then I was going to take it into, of course, the very next thing, which was um, then I'm sure we would not remember we were plants. But the question here, too, is in a sense, um, what happens to plants? Do they evolve into animals, or do they even have – I know that we're not aware of them having a consciousness, but where do they fit into the, the uh, reincarnation cycle, so to say? Well – you got to remember that all life is uh, emanates from the divine. Okay, so all life is essentially uh, an aspect of God, um, and I believe that um, things like plants and very basic animals, I think they they live in a sort of uh, quasi world of their own, and they're not really there to develop. They're just there to be plants or to be uh, a butterfly or to be whatever it is they're supposed to be, and, and then they. They, you know, they shed that form, and they move on to other experiences. Maybe they'll be a, 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 some other kind of plant or some other kind of animal. Eventually, however, this energy coalesces into uh, higher levels of awareness, what we would call consciousness. And eventually, we'll, these the, these energies begin to uh, come into a more human form or conscious forms. 
And that's where the real spiritual evolution takes place, is once you reach that point. And so, to answer your question, you know, plants and animals really don't reincarnate per se uh, in the respect that they would have memories of being something in the past or, you know, of experiences in their past life. But that's not to say that uh, they may not have an influence on our conscious incarnations. For example, you know, people have a very strong affinity a lot of times with animals, uh, horses or dogs and cats and things. I mean, I have three dogs of my, my own, I think, are, are almost like our children. And I wonder if that affinity that we feel for animals and things like that mm. or the beauty of plants isn't a part of our memory of, of having been in that world uh, many, 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 many thousands and thousands of years ago. That's very possible. And you know, this is one of the things we wanted to get into. So Jeff's background, his um, past life regression was, what, tell us about that, Jeff. It's, it's actually quite an interesting story. Well, when I was a teenager, I was extraordinarily fascinated with, uh, with World War II. I don't know why, because I didn't, I didn't come out of a military family. I was living on a farm in Minnesota, grew up uh, in the country. But I was fascinated with World War II. I was interested in Germany. Um, I, uh, and it seems like that was my preoccupation. And I never understood why. You know, cause it made me very different from most people. I wasn't into you know, music. I wasn't into all the stuff my, my uh, fellow students were into. I was just into military history. And then uh, many years later, when I began to study reincarnation and I uh, was regressed, it turns out that I actually uh, had been a soldier uh, during the Second World War in Germany and uh, I was killed in the fighting in Russia uh, very early on in that, in that war. And that explained to me a lot of my, my affinities that I had for German, things German, uh, the, the, even down to the footwear I used to wear. I used to wear these black Wellington boots. That was the only footwear I had. I didn't have tennis shoes. I didn't have anything else but these black Wellingtons. And if you think about it, a black Wellington boot is very close to the jack boots that the German soldiers wore. I mean, it's not exactly the same thing, but it's probably the closest equivalent you could find would be the jackboots. And so it was, it was just amazing to me how that life dictated so much of my adolescence and, and my affinities and my fascinations for things. And then when I was able to go into that regression, I was able to come up with a lot of information about uh, who I was back then, uh, where I came from, where I, where I grew up, how I became uh, into the Army. Uh, and all these different things, which to me was was really kind of reinforcing what I had already felt deep inside me, and uh, really gave me an insight into how the whole process works. This is um, it, so. Would you say you have more of an affinity? You talk about the Germans uh, with German culture, or did you have to relearn that at, from this point? Well, what happened was I, in high school, I, I took German. That was one of the languages offered, and that was the only one I was interested in taking. I'm not particularly good at it, but uh, I was interested in that culture. I've never been to Germany. I still haven't been to Germany. Oh, you must in come. My-, my background is German. We would love to have you there. <laughs> well, okay, I'll, I'll come over there. But okay. well, one of these days, who, we'll be who knows? Maybe I'll get on out there. But, you bet. <laughs> uh, uh, but... Uh, um, yeah, I, 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 it just seemed to be just a natural attraction to me. Um, but uh, that being said, as I got older, I was able to move past that and develop other interests and other affinities and, and other things in other areas. And by the time I was in my 30s or 40s, you know, the, this was no longer as big an issue in my life as it had been when I was an adolescent. And that's good, actually, because you don't want to just relive an old incarnation in, under a new name, you want to move on to new experiences. But you do have to be aware that what happened to you in past lives does seem to impact what happens to you to some degree in this life. And I'm not talking karma, I'm talking about just the, 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 choice, the choices you make, the things you like, the things you dislike. I don't know if you've ever met people that you just immediately took a liking to or took an immediate dislike to. These are often echoes from a past life, uh, either positive or negative. And, and it's, it just made more sense to me of why uh, I look at the world the way I do once I understood this. 
So some, one of our, uh, my co-hosts is asking about your age, and I think what the link-up is saying that, you know, you were probably in your embryonic form transitioning from the World War II, or are you talking about World War I, but I believe you're talking about World War II, uh, mm-hmm. into your current life. And uh, so how long would you invest in, do you do people go into storage for extended amounts of time? And then that brings us me to my one segue in this study that you made. And if anybody gets a chance to please read his articles on ghost personalities, they are phenomenal. He's written a book on ghosts. And he was actually able to typify the psychological breakdown of departed spirits, which I had a really good chuckle at because it's really the way I've been trying to describe it. You know, the difference between orbs, family spirits, um, pet spirits or animals. Um, We're talking about traditional hauntings, uh, inanimate spirits. So he did a fair amount of research and categorization of spirits. So we wanted to ask you, would you have been put into storage or have been put into a form? Would you have haunted Russia? <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, it's it's kind of a, a complex system. The more I research it, the more complexity I see in this whole process. Um, you've got to understand that the the personality is something we take on when we come into the flesh, just like we take on a body we also take on a personality. It's shaped by our experiences, the, our, our background, our, our upbringing, what kind of parenting we had, and all those things go into shaping that. Um, and then as we grow older, we begin to think of our personality as who we are, although it's really not who we are. Uh, we're actually a soul being, and we have a, a personality that exists higher and above what our, our current personality is. So, the question is, what happens when you die? Well, the, obviously the body is, is shed, uh, but also the, the personality uh, lingers for a time. And this is what becomes the ghost. And the soul itself returns to its source, to, to the spiritual okay. realm, uh, and continues to reincarnate. But uh, that personality may linger for anywhere from a few weeks to months to decades. In some so cases, for those of us that need clarification, the ghost is actually like a replica of your old soul. It might only be letr- literally the electro like handprint, but yet it can, in, this, in, in certain environments, linger and you know, harass a susceptible person. But it's good to know that in between, we don't have any kind of, that we're not stuck having to, you know, sit with our neighbors or haunt our place of death. I mean, that's a very comforting thought, you know? For those of us that actually do believe in life after death, the ones of us that wonder why we get stuck in between, it's really comforting to hear it's not the real soul. Right. The the soul itself is is immortal and impervious. It, it It goes on forever. But those personalities are temporary things that we, we inhabit. Um, and sometimes if you die with unfinished business or perhaps with a lot of rage, a lot of negative energy in your life, things like that, these things can keep you, kind of, that soul sort of stuck here. Instead of being absorbed back into the spiritual realm, uh, it actually lingers, uh, kind of with one foot in the spirit and one foot in the physical realm. And that can be, I think, a very unpleasant experience for some people. Uh, but it's a temporary experience. It's something that maybe they need to go through before they're ready to move on to the next spiritual lesson. So, it, it, in other words, it's such a, a series of complexities involved here. It's hard to say, okay, when you die, you do A, B, and C, and then you do this. Uh, it, it, there's, I think there's a lot of different options that we face and a lot of different directions that we can move when we, when we shed this, uh, this fleshly husk of ours and move on. And Beautiful being a word, ghost yeah. is one of them, um, and reincarnating is another one. Now, this is the weirdest question I'm ever going to put towards you. Maybe you can just uh, stay with me here. Um, I was reading up on, you know, there's the certain aspects of your writing, like, um, there was a quote uh, in your biblical uh, trans, uh, research about, we're talking about uh, people misinterpreting uh, Christ having come back to life and then being reborn and them having taken that as a sign, as reincarnation. And my point was uh, more in the sense of this. So, like, if you die here and you, pre- for some reason, because a lot of people are working on uh, life extension, 
uh, whether it's probably artificial, okay? And that that mm-hmm. would be a, truly a, a terror, but I, I know that many of us are expecting that through modern science. So what happens if you if you suddenly you die for 45 minutes, let's say, and they bring you back mm-hmm. to life? Could it be possible that you ever get reincarnated and then come back into your old body? Actually, that may be one option. You may be ha- have an opportunity to come back into the, the flesh and go down a different a different road. You know, you could make completely different decisions. Um, so I, I think that the, you have an option to come in as, as another person, uh, another gender, another race, and experience things from that perspective, or do your life over again, but just go down a different path than you went on this one. And so you get a second chance, maybe, in a way. It's, it's, not, it's, well, it's kind of like a second chance, but... Of course, you don't remember the other road you went down. So it's not really like redoing it. It's like moving down an entirely different road. I mean, have you ever wondered what your life would be like if you had had a different set of parents than you did? Or if you were born in another place and time than you were? Your life would probably be very different. And that's, that's the point I'm trying to make, is that uh, you may have that option of having a different experience within the context of the same incarnation. Uh, who knows? You may be able to have multiple incarnations at the same time because they're all being generated by that. the same the same parent's soul. I was so they're ask more like that. siblings. Pardon? Jeff, one of my clients once tried to ask me when her cat had passed why yeah. an infinite number of cats came to visit her. I just thought I'd relay to you that story. She was very confused at seeing a million of her little kitten come back to her. That mm-hmm. made me feel, and it would have probably been too daunting for her to imagine this, that her cat had actually been replicated into maybe a million different other lives. What mm-hmm. is beyond, like when we have ascended our, our, our course, our action at this point, Do we just go into one being, or could we not just somehow become an intelligent multi-being? What happens, or do we become the Godhead? Well, I believe that we become incorporated back into the Godhead. I think that we are like cells in God's body, and we are God's mechanisms that he uses to, or she, whichever your preference is, to experience itself. In other words... As, as long as God is spirit, uh, he or she can not really experience anything. They can se- conceptualize everything, can understand everything, but can't experience. In other words, how does God experience hunger or pain or depression or any of those things? They Maybe can only through do us. It conceptually. So he has to come into the flesh, or she, uh, in, in through us. And we are the ones who feel these things. We have these experiences. And through those, God gets a chance to experience itself. So that when we do die, we are actually incorporated back into the greater godhood, if you will. We become aware of God on that level. And now, now, now God's not just some you know, abstract concept out there. We're actually part of that, that Godhead now. We, can ha- we have that clarity, that understanding that we don't have on this planet. And then we decide what do we want to do next? What other experience does God want to have through us? And then we make a decision. Do we want to come back into the flesh? Do we want to go to another realm of existence, a different dimension entirely? Uh, I think that the choices are remarkable. So are we stuck on Earth if we want to reincarnate from Earth? Do we all have earthly memories? Does that mean once we've... Where do we... Can we leave this planet, do you think? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. However, uh, think of Earth as a particular college. You know, if you are going to college and every semester you change colleges, it becomes very difficult to keep a continuity in your education and your learning. So I think that we often choose to come back to Earth because this is a particular venue that we find uh, comfortable and that we need to sort of see all the way through. Uh, If we start jumping from planet to planet, then we kind of start from scratch again with a whole new venue, and that can be um, maybe a little detrimental to our growth. Who knows? The uh, question I wanted to ask you, and that's one that we all ask, why are we conscious now? 
But we, we can't be unconscious because we are uh, an emanation of the divine, and as long as God is alive, God is consciousness, and we are that aspect of him. We are conscious of that. The problem is, is that we tend to forget that, or we try to hide from it or bury it under all of the, the little things we do and say every day. And that's why when people become aware of the fact that they are a part of God, uh, it changes their lives because suddenly they, they become conscious in the way God is. And it changes everything about their lives and how they look at it and how they live it if they have really, truly come to that understanding. So would you say that one is more conscious in this life? Am I talking to some people that are unconscious, even if they pretend they are? Well, is it, is it a ruse? People, <laughs> people, well, people have different levels of, of consciousness. Some people are still in a, a fairly primordial state. They're very uh, into the moment, into the flesh, uh, into the pleasures of the flesh, the, whatever it is that's going on at that moment. And they're not, they're not looking beyond that. And then other people seem to be able to rise above that, and they have that kind of overwhelming awareness. Uh, so in a way, when you it, think you're conscious, you are. Well, you know, the, 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 the farther uh, you realize you have to go, the more conscious you are. It's kind of those things like uh, you're not really an adult until you realize how childish you are. <laughs> That's <laughs> it true. It seems like a That's contradiction. True. And so the, the, more, the more spiritually conscious you become, the farther you realize you need to go yet. Well, yeah, th that is the, the, the greatest question I've had on my mind, and it just seems the further one goes on in life, the more conscious one becomes. And, you know, we would love an end to that. And, and that before I have to, unfortunately, we have to um, probably say our goodbyes, but I wanted to ask you, for those of us, that don't want to come back. We just don't wanna. Can we go to bed for a bit? Can we like decide to wake up in a million years? Well, what Absolutely. do you think that we, one can do, or does one have to go back to school? No, no. I, I think that a person can do whatever they feel led to do. The the question is, uh, once you realize that living life is the only game in town, uh, you're going to be willing to come back to it. However, nothing is ever forced upon you. I think uh, the one thing God has given us is free will, and that's the, fr that's the free will to come back or the free will not to come back if we don't want to or to come into some other experience that uh, has nothing to do with what we've had up to now. Goodness, so, uh, that is such a relief, Jeff, for all of us <laughs> out there that are going to have, like, sighs of relief and, you know, a much better night's sleep is that there is, you know, with that there is a free will even to how one spends one's afterlife. It's mm -hmm. very, very enlightening. I really did enjoy our chat. Um, we might uh, be uh, disconnected for now. I'm going to have to introduce our uh, next week's uh, guest. But Jeff, thank you so much. And for those of you that want to review his work, it's, uh, his work is on ourcuriousworld.com. He has published through Llewellyn, which is a very large mystic book publisher. They, are, they usually only take on the best writers. I want to tell you he is of a very high caliber. The book that we were talking about today was The Case for Reincarnation. And uh, we have other, you know, his, his, his novels are listed on there, including his new book called The Nightman, which is also a Sasquatch mystery. So... <laughs> Well, Carmen, I really had a great time. I appreciate you having on, and, and uh, I look forward to hearing from any of your readers through my website. When you're yes, listening. absolutely. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye-bye. You too, dear. Bye-bye. Hello. My name is Res Miranda. If you're having relationship, career, or life issues, I'm inviting you to experience what it's like to have access to professional, highly accurate psychics and spiritual advisors you can trust to care and help you. Register now to get your free 6-minute reading by telephone or chat. Get answers. Get access. Psychic access. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. PsychicAccess.com